All right. Hey, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the students, wherever you are. I'm Vivek. I'm one of the founders and CEO of HackerRank. Welcome, everyone, to our virtual career fair 2021. Um, we, this is our second edition. We actually did the first one last year, and it was actually born out of almost like a crisis when customers couldn't actually visit universities in person. And so it really started off as an experiment for us to put up a contest virtually and invite students to participate and showcase their skills to companies. But today it is starting to become the de facto way for students to go ahead and showcase their skills and get jobs because a lot of our customers have now realized, wow, there is talent everywhere. And we were stuck with just like going to 10 or 15 schools prior to virtual career fair. So super, super excited to welcome all of you to the second edition. We have over 10,000 people registered for the contest from uh, 400 plus universities. It's pretty stunning to actually go ahead and see the breadth. And we have some great, amazing technology companies who have sessions who are like very, very excited to talk to all of you. I know this firsthand because I talk to a bunch of customers uh, on a on a day to day basis, and they're all very much looking forward to this particular event. Um, so we're going to kick off with a keynote um, from Doc from Professor Steven Skina from Stony Brook University. Um, I I have a, a you know, I've, I've known Steve for the last five to six years. He's actually an advisor to HackerRank, but I have known of him and his books way, way for, for a very long time, actually since, since my college, uh, where I used to use his uh, algorithm design manual as a way for me to like go ahead and prepare for interviews and like the collegiate programming contest that we used to have and things on those lines. And never, I, I never really thought, firstly, I would actually, you know, sort of meet, uh, meet him in person and uh, never really thought that I would meet him in person and actually get him on as an advisor and never really thought that I would meet him in person, get him as an advisor, get him to talk to the keynote, as well as give me a gift of his latest edition, the algorithm design manual, which always exists right at the top of the bookshelf. Now, granted, it's been a long time since I actually coded any kind of uh, real algorithm challenge. It's been a while, but certainly like when I, when I actually browse through these pages, all those memories flash back, like, you know, how did you do BFS? How did you do DFS? How did you do all of these uh, string manipulation algorithms? So very, very excited. And, and, and Steve is going to talk about like, what does it take for you to actually go ahead and make sure that you're well prepared for job? Tech market is hot. Everybody is looking for amazing developers. But what can you do to make sure that you can maximize your chances and get the dream job that you want? So without further ado, Let's welcome Steve. I call I call him Steve, but like you can call him Professor Steven Skina. Like, let's welcome Steve on stage. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you very Vivek for that uh, introduction. Um, I'm. I, I hope my slides are visible. If not, I want somebody to intervene. But um, you know, as Vivek said, I was an advisor at Hacker Rank, and this is great. They gave me options. That's a good thing. And if any of you have startups that want advice from me, I'll, I'll be happy to take options from you guys. But um, the best part of being a professor is giving advice, actually. Over the course of, um, you know, I've been teaching at Stony Brook for more than 30 years. Um, I am often asked by students for advice about life. What should I do after graduation? How do I find uh, what job I should get? Um, Again, the, the movie picture here is from a movie many of you may recognize called It's a Wonderful Life. And it was about a uh, guy, Jimmy Stewart in the center, who, you know, is a good guy, has done a lot of good for people, but kind of is frustrated and is wonders, oh, my goodness, what if it would be better if I had never existed? And, you know, in the movie, they go back and show him how life is, how many lives he affected and touched. And it, it's a great movie. So I encourage you to watch the movie. Um, so today I'm going to try to earn myself some It's a Wonderful Life points by um, trying to tell you, um, give you advice that may help you on some of these important matters. Um, if you have questions, I'm hoping we're going to have time for questions. Don't be afraid to pose them in the Q&A channel. Um, so the first question that students often ask me is, oh, my God, will I find a job? And the answer to this one is actually quite easy, okay? I can guarantee you we all will find jobs. Um, 
the uh, you know unemployment rate in the U.S. is you know even though we're in strange economic times, um, you know your skills clearly rank in the top 95 percent of all possible job seekers. Um, by comparison, only 90 percent of students graduate high school. You guys are certainly, I suspect, in general above that. If you look, you're going to find a job. So let me put your mind at ease about that. Students sometimes ask, will I get my dream job? And the answer to that, I'm going to tell you, is probably not, okay? Um, so long as there's competition for the dream job, somebody isn't getting the job. And, um, you know, that said, so don't get yourself too hung up on, oh, my God, I got to get my job with company X, okay? I've got to, you know, get this particular kind of a position. If you look diligently, I'm sure you will find a job that is going to provide for your needs, let you do interesting things, and help you grow as a person. Certainly, I've dealt with hundreds and thousands of students, and that seems to be what happens. Okay? Fair enough. Now, if you want to start the question of, um, you know, how you should look for a job, what I would say is that the the... the the biggest single thing is trying to figure out what you want out of life. Um, many people, uh, you know, the immediate, the immediate thing when you think about getting a job is, oh, I want to make a lot of money, and making a lot of money is good. But um, there are other questions that you should be thinking about when it comes time to doing a search, to help focus your search in the right place. It's important to kind of understand what makes you a happy person, okay? Um, that may involve you may have a geographic preference. You may want to live in a particular, in a city or in the country. You may want to be near people that you love, okay? You may be a kind of person that wants a startup and wants to be in a little team. Or you may want the, 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 the glow of a big company, okay? You, you may have ideas of what your, you know, optimal life balance is. And this is something that, you know, at this stage in your job search, you should be thinking about. You shouldn't just be, a, you know, um, madly applying to anything. You should focus it on things that you think will 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 make you happy. Um, the the figure I have on the right, okay, is a curve showing the notion of Pareto optimality. So, so we get a little technical content here. It's this idea that there are many many different let's say, if you have a lot of different criteria about what makes something desirable, okay, there are many different possible solutions to what is the best, okay, depending, and it depends upon how much you value each of the individual factors. So in order to try to find what, you know, of all those red points, A through H, okay, all of those are optimal for some combination of preferences. Okay, you have to figure out what your preferences are and uh, figure out what you want out of life. Once you figure out what you want out of life, uh, the next question is, how do you go and find a good job? Now, attending a career fair like this is a good start. Um, I have some other tips that uh, I would like to pass on. One thing is to have your parents review your resume. Why should your parents review your resume? Well, they they may have different ideas about spelling and grammar than you have, okay? Maybe some more experience in those directions. That's one reason why it's good to have them, them look things over. But another is that your, your parents probably are the one who have monitored your life and career and accomplishments better than everybody else. And it may very well be that when you try to put together your resume, there are things you have done that your parents remember that you don't even remember. And um, I think that by showing them the resume and talking to them about them, you might, might find some interesting things that should be on there. And finally, of course, your parents will love the idea of uh, looking at your resume and being part of this process. Where should you apply? One thing I tell all my students is that they should apply any place better than McDonald's, at least until they get a job that's better than McDonald's. Um, sometimes I have students who are very, very selective in where they will apply. And if they get a job at one of these places, that's great, okay? But if they don't, they're then in trouble. 
Okay, you can't say yes to anything you didn't apply to. Okay, you can always say no to an offer. So I encourage people to apply broadly, and that's, you know, that takes a lot of work, um, but I encourage you to do that. I also encourage people to apply to companies early, the ones that they really want early. Um, sometimes people will start applying to jobs. What's the best thing that could happen if you start applying for jobs? Well, the best thing is that one of the job first places you apply to says yes. If they say yes, they're then going to probably give you a window during which you can apply, you, you, during which you have to accept their offer. And, um, you know, uh, you don't want to be in a position where you have to decide whether to say yes to this, you know, first company you applied to, okay, before you get to hear from the ones you really want to. So, so apply to the ones that you're most excited to early and then keep applying until you get what you want. I also encourage students to, to think outside the big, you know, the biggest, most famous software companies. Every company is doing something with software these days. Many smaller companies are doing very interesting things. And so expand your search beyond the very hottest companies, okay, so that you make sure that you uh, get a chance to, you know, to see what's out there. Now. Where I start to come into the process, people is something related to interview prep. Um, and I often get approached by students who say, oh my God, I got to cram for my job interviews. How do I learn algorithms in a week or something like this? Well, one thing I believe is that if it was possible to cram for job interviews, then the entire search process for, for, for hiring is, is completely broken. Okay, companies are spending a lot of time trying to know you to decide who's going to be the best person for a job that's they're going to want them to work for them for 5 10 20 years okay if if you could do something to cram for it the night before then then that's dumb okay generally speaking i find that the students when the students tell me what where, where they got offers the ones that are the best get the best offers generally are the best students okay I encourage you to prepare for interviews, but I don't think that you need to, you know, kind of kind of cram for try to cram for these things. The reason you're preparing for interviews, I think, in general, is to improve your confidence. OK, when you're talking to someone, you want to know, find, make sure you know in advance what questions do the interviewers ask. You, you want to be sure you really understand what the company's products are and what they do. OK. And you want to think about what questions you really need to ask them to get a good idea of what that company is and whether it's working best for you. Um, again, at one point I had a startup, general sentiment, and you know, the interview question, the only real question I ever asked people when we hired them, the interview question, was tell me about yourself. And from that, I would usually learn a lot. I could ask follow-on questions and feel I really got to know them. So try to have an answer to a question about what's 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 interesting about you. The, the final advice here that I really want to encourage is that you set aside enough time to do your search right. Sometimes, occasionally, I get into students who I run into students who say, "Oh, I'm too busy to look for a job. I'll do it after I graduate." Yeah, yeah, yeah. I personally believe that if you are a senior student, you're getting ready to uh, get a, planning on getting a job next year, your job search is more important than all your classes except the one I'm teaching. Okay, I encourage you to spend the time to do what's right for uh, your class, you know, to make sure you, you, you do a good job getting your, uh, doing your search right. Now, I got into, you know, again, the reason why people talk to me about um, job interviews is largely because they have used my book for review, okay? They have, you know, that algorithms kind of comes up very strongly in um, job interviews in computer science. And it, it's an interesting question of why that is. You know, the average job out there does not require using algorithms on a day-to-day -day basis, you know? Um, it's important, as Rebecca said, it's great to know about DFS and dynamic programming and all of these things. You're probably in your job not going to be doing that every day. Yet, um, why is it so important for the job interview? 
Well, the main reason I think is that algorithm design requires creativity and it requires a, a certain intellect and a way of looking at things. And these are harder to tell from looking at a resume or a, a grade transcript than, than many other things. Um, you can usually tell if someone's a hard worker, if they've got a good GPA. You can usually tell they're probably kind of bright. But to measure creativity, algorithm design problems are good. And uh, many companies like Google started, I think, started the process, started asking all their um, candidates algorithm design problems. One thing I have discovered from talking to students is that often the person asking you the interview question doesn't know that much about algorithms themselves. Um, you know, typically just because somebody got hired at a company doesn't mean that they were an algorithm expert. Um, they probably th knew something at some point. Um, often they, 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 they kind of, you know, I've even had students come back and say that the, that the interviewer botched the solution to the problem. If you're faced with a whiteboard task of trying to answer an algorithm problem, start by restating the problem, give some examples to show that you know what you're, you're doing. Start then by giving a very simple, correct, slow algorithm before you start getting cute. Again, they're trying to see some kind of a thought process here. And I think that, um, that that's kind of what you want to do. You want to show a, sort pro a, a, a thought process instead of kind of getting ca caught up and, uh, and, and trapped because you don't know the really hard answer. Um, again, I encourage people doing these hacker rank programming challenges. The best ones of them involve some kind of algorithm, the ones that design, not just programming. Now, how should you learn about algorithms? Well, there's one book that I recommend to everybody, and that, of course, is my book, The Algorithm Design Manual. Um, you know, I think it's better to try to learn an important subject well than try to cram through, you know, you know, just try to cram something to get through your interviews. Um, I think that people learn a lot by learning about algorithm design. In my book, I try to explain more about why. Why is it that you're doing things rather than sort of just what, you know, details of uh, specific algorithms or specific analyses. Um, and many people seem to like it. Um, and one li little clue that, that's helpful is in the third edition of my book, uh, I now have hacker rank challenges in the back of every chapter that are relevant to the subject matter. So I encourage people to kind of go and, and, and do some programming and get that kind of stuff. When, when asked, how do you get better at these interview coding problems, which are usually now a barrier before you get real interviews? Um, I will say that practice definitely makes makes better, okay? Um, you know, the more practice you do, the better you get. Um, eventually, your progress is going to level off, and so I don't encourage you to go too crazy with it. Do it while you're having fun. Um, one thing I particularly recommend is if you are uh, a junior or an early college student, um, I recommend you try to get involved with your ACM, ICPC team. Most colleges have a, um, a uh, you know, a programming contest team. Um, they usually have some training. These kind of problems are a lot of fun. And um, I encourage people to uh, go and try to work through these. Um, there's, a, there's an interesting trick. It's different than finding necessarily the deepest algorithm for something, but trying to find something where you can find a quick program, quick data structures for solving acute problem. These contests are fun, and I encourage you to play with that. So now, let's say you've, hopefully, you will do well on your uh, hacker rank challenges and get through to actually getting a real interview. Um, what advice do I give people for when they are on an interview? Um, one thing is to understand that, you know, for any job worth having, there are many, many candidates that are at about your, your technical level. And the ultimate decision is going to be one about um, where do you, you know, who do people want to work with? They want people with good skills, but they want people that they like. They want people that they trust to be good workers. They don't want to work with an asshole. Okay. And, um, you know, it's important that when you're on an interview, you should be yourself 
but it's important not to be too arrogant. It's important not to be uh, too demanding, to be too opinionated. Okay, be your best self. Um, when you're on an interview, it's obviously the wrong time to discuss controversial topics like politics or vaccination or religion. Um, but as I was preparing this talk, I remembered a story I had about a time when real estate was a controversial topic. As a professor, I'm often on um, committees for, uh, you know, other departments, you know, kind of an outside member to review their faculty candidates. And anyway, one day I was, you know, going to lunch with their candidate. He was in some science area. I don't know if it was chemistry or physics or science. Who knows? But, um, you know, he's, you know, I, I mentioned that I liked living in Manhattan. I happened to really like living in Manhattan. And this guy had a strong feeling that Brooklyn was the capital of the world. And he was letting me know that anyone who was in, you know, uh, you know, who thought Manhattan was great, Brooklyn is the place to be. And he was quite adamant about it. So I said, okay, watch out. Later on, when it came time to review the candidates, you know, all the rest of the committee was saying, okay, talk about it. And the guy would say, they would all say, oh, this guy's a great chemist, great research, great everything. And finally said, Steve, what do you think? I said, well, I don't know anything about chemistry, but I'll admit that I found this guy a little irritating to deal with. And then suddenly around the room, people started saying, yeah, I also found him irritating. Yeah, he was a real pain in the neck. I don't want him here. And sure enough, this gentleman who was apparently a great chemist is presumably still in Brooklyn because he didn't get the job that we were talking about here. So be your best self when you're on one of these interviews. Another question that comes up with students a lot is how do you negotiate? Hopefully you go through the interview, they're gonna like you, okay? How should you negotiate your job offer? And there's an important principle of life I have to teach people, which maybe you've already heard, which is that you don't get in life what you deserve, you get what you negotiate. This is something to remember, you get what you negotiate. And Many people are, most people, I think, are really not good at negotiating. Um, uh, and negotiating is a skill that's worth, you know, gaining some expertise at. You're going to be doing it over your life. You're going to be negotiating a job offer. You're going to be negotiating raises. You're going to be negotiating if you decide to buy a house or go into business. Negotiations are important things. If you negotiate when you're dealing with people, um, so how do you learn to be a good negotiator? Okay. Being a good negotiator, I think involves a couple of things. First of all, it involves having a philosophy of negotiation. Okay. It involves knowing what's important to you. Um, and what I'd like to recommend is this book called Getting to Yes. This book, Getting to Yes by Roger Fisher is a, you know, it's a paperback. It's uh, not that hard to read. But it tries to establish a philosophy of negotiating that I think is important for uh, people to, it's more for people to have a philosophy. Some people are kind of stamp on the table and angrily say, more, give me more, give me more. Okay, that's one philosophy. Okay. But the, the, the philosophy in getting to yes that I kind of like involves a couple of things. It involves, first of all, knowing what you really want. Okay. It involves negotiating based on principles instead of positions, okay? When a company offers you a, a salary, uh, if you say, give me $25,000 more than that, you're negotiating a position. You're negotiating based on numbers. If you say, well, look, I have a job offer here that's paying me this much, okay? I would like you to match that. That's a principle. If you say, well, the average salary for someone in this company is X, okay? I want you to realize that. That's negotiating principles, involves doing some research, okay? Um, establishing a BATNA is a uh, important thing. You know, my God, where do, what's a BATNA? How do I buy a BATNA? A BATNA is knowing what your best alternative to a negotiated agreement is. So this is kind of a measure way of, of, of capturing some kind of leverage, okay? 
you know, if you know, if you have another job offer, that gives you a good alternative. Okay, you can always walk from the guy that you're trying to talk to. So I do recommend trying to understand negotiation, get practice in it as you can, and uh, it's an important skill through life. I encourage people to be honest in their dealings with companies. I like to think I'm a very honest individual. I pay all my taxes. I, um, you know, I, I am, I'm honest in all my dealings with people. I don't like to think I lie. When you're dealing with a company, I encourage you not to lie until they absolutely make you. Okay. And what does that mean? Um, Again, on some level, you know, you know, if, there's a company that, you know, just gives you the first offer and you don't have any other offer. Do you say yes? No. If you're convinced that you're going to get better offer, other offers later, you turn them down. Okay. But again, ultimately getting the right job, making sure you go to the right job is more important to you than it is to the company that you're going to be going to. And um, again, I encourage you to to take agreement seriously but I don't encourage anyone to make themselves a martyr. What else can I say? Well, um, you know, after you've got your job, okay, you you know, what is what should you be doing? Well, you got to think about the rest of your life and um, what you want to do from then on. Um, you know, almost, I have been fortunate that at Stony Brook, I have been here for 30, I think it's 32 years now. Um, I haven't had to look for another job. I haven't had to change jobs. But in general, you're going to have to, you know, most of you, I suspect, will change jobs many times over the course of your career. Often you need to change jobs to learn new skills or to get better pay. Um, You know, sometimes people fall into a trap where after they work for, you know, a company for 10 years, okay, you know, what you've been really doing is learning the details of one particular product at this company. And you may know all the all the whiz bang things about the internals of the software that you're actually working on. And this has a value to the company until they decide to dump that product, until they decide that maybe that product isn't doing so well in the market anymore. OK, so. You know, I encourage you to make sure you know what's going on in the world, what what technologies are in demand. You should know what your friends are doing. Um, again, it may you may not believe this, but at some point you're going to turn, I'll say, 40 years old. OK. And, um, you know, I have I, I found when I turned 40, many of the computer science people I grew up with who went into industry, suddenly found their 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 skills weren't as good and that the job that they were doing wasn't so exciting anymore and it wasn't clear that there were options really to keep going okay you have to wear your tennis shoes in this kind of a world so keep learning skills look around to look for chances to move in in your company okay within the company don't be afraid after a small number of years to, to look out out for other opportunities. Okay, it's important not to show you know a loyalty to the company that isn't necessarily returned. Okay. Any questions? The question that I probably get most as a college professor about life and and what to do afterwards is the question of whether I should go to graduate school. Now, graduate school is, I think, a great thing for the right students to do. Um, It's a way to get a a, a deeper technical background. I find that, you know, our undergraduate computer science students get jobs. Our graduate students with master's degrees and PhDs, they get jobs. The jobs that the graduate students get are often more interesting and more exciting, okay? Um, And that's because they know more technically. Um, Now, when you, you know, there's times later on, maybe after you've been working for many years, when you kind of realize that your technical skills are atrophying, and then it would be good to go to grad school. But it's often much harder to go to graduate school once you have a family. Okay, I don't see too many of the of our students coming back. Okay, once they have a family, 
And once you get used to working and once you get used to having a real paycheck, um, this is one reason why either doing a master's degree right after graduation or a BS, MS type program can be a good thing. Um, you know, uh, I think that in general, if I say who should go to graduate school, I think of the students that are in the top 30% of their, their graduating class, these are students who should seriously consider going to graduate school. Um, earning a, uh, usually people will go back for a master's degree. And um, I think that that's, 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 that's often a good thing. Again, I teach at Stony Brook. We have excellent master's programs and PhD programs if you want, but so do many other schools. Um, one of the lessons that I find of, of life that was important at gra after grad school is that you learn something about living poor, okay? Um, you know, after your undergraduate degree, you'll be sort of, on, many of you will be on your own sort of for the first time. Maybe there will be a stipend that you'll be earning to, while in graduate school to help pay the bills. Often people learn that they can get along with a certain amount of money and they, get, they can have a roof over their head and they can eat and, and, and on, you know, let's say just a, like a teaching assistantship. And um, this is a good lesson. Um, some students may be interested in PhDs. I think PhD programs are great if you want to do serious research, if you want to teach. Understand that a PhD program is a five-year commitment. So if you're, this is a job fair, most people going to a job fair probably are looking for a job. I, I you know, some of the, you know, a PhD probably is not in, in the cards for most of you. But um, uh, it is something that, uh, you know, is, is something people can do. And I think it's good if they can do it. What other life advice can I offer people? Um, first of all, I will tell you to save your money. Um, now, after you, this is done, hopefully you've got a job. Hopefully you've got a good job. Your job probably comes with a 401k program, gives you a way to save for retirement. It's important that you learn to save save for retirement. It's important you learn to save your money. It gives you flexibility, among other things, if you need to go to graduate school later. It's also the case that you're probably going to need that money more when, you, you know, maybe later in life when you have a family and stuff like that. What should you do with your investment money? I am not uh, really an investment counselor. But I can tell you that a lot of people play around with their money and they use Robin Hood and all these kind of active trading things. And typically they don't do as anywhere near as well as they think. Um, the stock market has the property that it's kind of like a, a, a gambling system that's rigged in your favor. If you put your money into a general index fund, something like standard, the S&P 500, and you leave it alone and don't mess with it. By the time you need the money 10 years later, 20 years later, 30 years later, you may be surprised how much is there. OK, so I, I, I encourage people to do such things. Many of you as part of your uh, job offers, if you go for a company, the company may give you stock or give you options. And that, of course, is great. One thing that I encourage you to do is if you're working for a company, the moment they actually give you stock, I think that's a great time to sell it. Why? Well, first, you should take that money and put it back into one of these index funds. So I certainly think you should be saving and investing. Um, but there is risk if you have all your money invested in some sense in the same company that you're working for. If you are working for a DigiScam company or whatever you're working for, and they start to run into financial trouble, both your job and your savings would be at risk. You want to diversify that. And so that's the theory over there. Um, what other advice can I give you? Well, I'm going to encourage you all to choose the right life partner. I'm going to encourage you to have kids. I'll tell you, don't do drugs. And I will encourage you to wear sunscreen. With all that, that's basically all I have to say at this point. Um, I, I hope it, it is helpful, but I hope it uh, starts some questions uh, about, uh, I'm happy to talk anything you want about life, algorithms, anything you want. And at this point, I turn over to questions. All right. 
Thank you, Professor Skiana. That was some really great advice. I'm sure everyone in the audience can take something away from that. Uh, let's go ahead and get some questions from the audience here. All right, first one is from Kalita. What is the best way to highlight your strengths if you feel weak technically? Okay, what's the best way to highlight your strengths if you're weak technically? Um, well, first of all, you're, you're, this, this may get back to the thing about talking to your mother and father, okay? There probably are other accomplishments that you have, okay, that are worth, worth noting there. If you're weak technically and you're applying for a technical job, the best recommendation is try to get stronger technically. And, um, you know, this may, this may involve self-study. Again, if you're weak in, in algorithms, I tell you how to self-study, okay? That's why I've got a book and that's why my lectures are on, the, on YouTube and stuff like that. Um, but recognize that, that there's a variety of different skills that companies need. Okay, technical skills are important for certain classes of technical jobs. Communication skills are also important, okay? And many other things are important. So figure out what you're good at and let that, I would, my, my instinct would be let that lead what you're gonna be uh, applying for, okay? Uh, and, and, and maybe that will be, maybe that'll help you out, I hope so. Great. Next question is from Angelina. What is the best way to make a first impression slash introduce with a recruiter to make a long lasting connection? Okay, what's the best way to make it a, 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 a good first impression? Um, I don't know if I made a good first impression here or not, so uh, maybe I'm not an expert. But what I would say is uh, to a certain extent, I encourage you to be yourself. And again, as I say, your best self, um, you know, you 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 want to show that you're interested in what the other person is saying. You want to know that that you're show that you're interested in the company. That ideally means that you know something about the company and what you're doing. Okay, what the, what they're doing. Okay, and have a reason why you're interested in this company, and they can make can communicate that to the recruiter. Okay, but basically the computer is going to be recruiter is going to be looking for someone who is a good, um, you know, going to be a good addition to teams. They want someone who's going to be able to work well with others. They're going to want, well, yes, they want technical skills, but they also want someone who people will like, like, like having, having on their project, okay, who can communicate. And I think that when, when you're reaching out to them, communication is probably a particularly good thing for them to tell, to, that they're interested in. So again, if, if you're doing it by text, make sure that you don't have horrible spelling and grammar and that, that, that you look like someone who can, can communicate. Okay, great advice. Next question is from John. If you're a self-taught programmer, what are ways you can signal your talent such that a recruiter or a company looking at your resume will want to interview you? Um, and he's asking if personal projects is a good way to do that. So this is interesting. Um, again, obviously, I'm used to dealing with college students, and I am used to dealing with computer science students. And so, the way that they communicate what they what they know is usually through their degree. There are self-taught people, and um, you know, uh, you know, how do you show people this? To a certain extent, may be the problem that Hacker Rank was was designed to solve. If I have to think back on it. One of the reasons why a lot of these companies, you know, use a product like HackerRank to do screening by giving people kind of programming challenges at the beginning is to identify people who can do the challenges as opposed to just the people who have degrees. So one argument might be that maybe this is the kind of thing that you should practice and get good at. OK, because then it will kind of you will be able to get past these screening tests and prove that you have that level of technical ability. Other than that, you know, projects that you work on are good. Some people tell me that they work on open source projects so that they can, um, you know, kind of demonstrate to others that they that they have done something and point to something on, on the web that they, that they did. And that's probably helpful. Um, you know, and, you know, and again, I, part of that then involves trying to pick a project that is good for you to be doing. If you're doing a project 
one thing I encourage you to do is pick a project that you like working on, okay, and that you do something that interests you. That's probably the thing that you're going to kind of do best at, and it will show in the final product. Okay, but good luck with that. Okay, thank you. Next question is from Sakshan. He's wondering, uh, how do you set yourself apart from other applicants with a similar skill set? He says, I have tried to reach out to recruiters, but haven't had any luck so far. So how do you stand out from the car from the crowd of other developers who have kind of the similar technical background? Okay, so so there is this problem that that you know so there are a couple things that I guess I'd first first of all I would say it is this is one reason why it pays to apply to a lot of different positions okay and it pays pays to apply to the positions that are not necessarily the hottest things out there I think many sometimes people say oh my god I got to work for Google and Facebook and uh, Amazon and those are the only companies out there and no they're not the only companies out there and no they probably represent less than 5% of all the programming jobs in the country. That's my guess. That, that's not a real statistic. But um, so I do encourage you to uh, look more broadly, okay? And broadly, again, I don't know where you live. Broadly may mean looking in a local geographic area and going down companies that are, that are in that area, okay? Uh, if there's a place where you want to live, trying to find out what are the, the biggest or what, what companies are most interesting in the little part of the world that you like most, okay? That's a good thing. Assuming the little part of the country, little part of the world you like most is not the Silicon Valley. I mean, there's a lot of other jobs out there. Um, you know, the question about standing out, you know, is a little bit hard for me. I, I think recognize that most decisions at these companies are being made for arbitrary reasons. Um, at least at the, at the initial screening thing. The big companies are certainly getting so many resumes. Their first job is to throw out as many as they can so they have a small number that they can concentrate on. Um, maybe one thing is to figure out where in the process you're, you're getting, um, let's say, you're, you're having trouble. Are you having trouble on your in-person interviews? If so, that may suggest some kind of a human thing and that, you know, you may need to work a little bit better on how you, you know, on, you, you know, you're, you know, you, you know, how, how you behave and stuff like that. It could be that, um, you know, your, 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 your skills are not good enough, in which case you probably want to make sure you're applying to a jobs where your skills are good enough. If I applied for a job on brain surgery, I would not get it because my skills are not good enough in that domain. And uh, I encourage you to, again, know yourself, look look broadly, and don't just be seduced into looking at the most popular jobs. And maybe then that will help you out. Okay. Next question is from Ben. Does your advice change for a professional making a career change versus a student? If so, how? So professionals ch changing, making career changes are interesting. So that first of all, um, you know, and I've spoken to a bunch of them over the years. Many of them self-study. I, I, you know, I often get emails from people who have read my algorithms book and said, oh, now I, I was able to learn on this and I was able to get, you know, my background wasn't CS, but now I got enough that I could, you know, get through the interview process. Um, you know, transferring, ch changing, what what you know change making a midlife change is hard um you know my my default advice which would be to say well go back and get a master's degree in computer science someplace is good advice for people who can do it but that may not work if you have a family that may not work if you you know need income and you can't take two years off or a year off to go and do these kinds of things um what i would probably say is it you know, my initial thought is if you're looking for a, a career change, you know, a really kind of a change in direction, maybe the right thing to do is to start small. So I'm kind of imagining that that a lot of companies have hard times hiring software developers. OK, if you're, you know, a uh, let's let just let's just say that you're a uh, fast food chain. OK, and that you need people to do some software developing on, you know, some of the business software. 
you know, this this may be the kind of position that is um, that, that, that they don't have as many applicants for. They can't be as fussy with what uh, with screening people away. OK, I kind of encourage people to kind of start, perhaps if you're changing positions, don't be afraid to start a little bit low, get some experience. And once you have experience that is demonstrable that you're a, you know, you're a software professional, then you can maybe look for better stuff. Um, I don't know if that helps, but that's that's what comes to mind. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, the next one I think is relatable for a lot of people in the professional um, field right now. How would you explain employment gaps due to COVID-19? I graduated last year, but failed to find employment due to some personal circumstances. I'm ready to start looking, but dread the question. So, you know, obviously this is a weird time in the job market. Um, on one level, unemployment, you know, seems relatively high, you know, by, by historical standards or recent historical standards. On the other level, you hear companies really screaming that they don't have enough employees and uh, they can't find people that work for them. You know, and, you know, again, I, I, I guess I don't really have any um, real insight into this. My, my sense is this is not a bad, this is actually a pretty good time to be looking. If you are a software person, this is a good time to be looking. If you looked a year ago, the world looked like it was ending a year ago. And so there was a great deal of uncertainty and companies were probably not hiring. They didn't know what they were going to be doing. It's hard for a software company to, to bring somebody on board remotely. Okay, it's a lot easier when you can, you know, work with them closely and stuff like that. But my instinct is that the world is getting ready to start again. And so I think that even if you had a tough time a year ago, I do think that um, my, my instinct is this is a good time to be looking for a job. Um, and I certainly hope you guys are going to be able to do that. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. So next one is, I think, also very relatable to this audience. How to get around the chicken and egg problem of you don't have enough experience for a job and you need a job to have experience. Right. So my brother, OK, once uh, was was ranting and raving about something he was getting. He got a book on how to build a good resume. And um, he says, God darn it. He says, why is it that all the people in the re when they use as examples for how to write a resume, all these people have great backgrounds? OK. Um, you know, it's easy to write a, re a, a resume if you cured cancer and started three, you know, started three Fortune 500 companies. What about how do you write a resume when you have no accomplishments? Um, and, you know, this is one reason I, I, I guess I made the recommendation about asking your mother and father, because I think that uh, you may have more things to put on your resume than you think. Um, I do think that internships and, you know, starting with the jobs you can get are actually good things for working your way up. Um, I, I, you know, uh, you know, I did, I remember my first job was, you know, I was, you know, backing up disks on a, uh, you know, on a computer system. It was a very, very, you know, low tech kind of thing, but I learned about the world. I had a line to put on my resume and that helped me get the second job. So. You know, the, the, the main thing that I'd say is that, that, that it's about looking broadly and not – the trap that I sometimes see people do is that they only apply to the most obvious companies, okay? And looking at – once you have, let's say, a, a, a focused area, let's say like you want to live, the local – if you want to live in a particular area, finding all the companies that are there – there's a range of jobs that involve computing that any company will have, okay, from relatively low tech things to, you know, to, you know, interesting, great, interesting software development jobs. And at the very, very beginning, I encourage you to find, find what you can get. You can always turn a job down, but you can never get a job that you didn't apply for. And so apply, you know, to, to small places. If you were at a college, there's a career fair. There's a, there's a, there's a, um, what you call it. There's, there's almost certainly a, uh, career center at your comp, at your, your college. Often these things are, are good even after you graduated. 
So if you go back to the company, the, the, the school that you graduated from and said, you know, I was I was there X numbers of years ago. Do you have any services to help me? OK, I think that they will generally listen to you and uh, may be able to, to point you to opportunities in a local area that you may not have thought about. OK, thank you, everyone, for the great questions. Uh, we have time for just a couple more, I think. Next question is from Jason. How much time do you think should be devoted to algorithms slash data structures studying versus building projects and networking for students and graduates? Okay, so with the question of how do you allocate your time, okay, you know, when, when, when you ask yourself, should you know about algorithms? The answer is yes. Should you know about systems? Yes. Do you know about everything? The answer is yes. And that, of course, means you can't devote 100% of your time to everything. Um, you know, this is a question people have to kind of ask themselves about what their, their background is. Um, you know, I, I personally believe that breadth is better than depth. If I have to pick one of these things, um, you know, I think that, that knowing more about a wider variety of things is in general, I think more useful than being a, a super expert in a, in a concentrated space. Not everyone will agree with me on this, but in a world where people change jobs every, you know, every few years, okay, it's because you know you you, you kind of are going to be needing different skills and different different worlds, you know, at, at at each place. So I think that breadth is actually a good thing. How much should you study algorithms? It probably the well, one thing I would say is I I kind of think that someone who spent a week with my algorithms book would know algorithms much better than when they started, okay? Does that mean that they're a pro and they're, they're, they're gonna be able to do everything? The answer is no. But I do believe that in a field like that, in a solid week of studying, I think you can, uh, you know, again, I'm assuming you've had a background in data structures, uh, you know, you know, you, you, you know, basic programming things. I think that a, a dedicating a good week is, a, you know, will, will, will teach you something. Obviously, I encourage people to take an algorithms class at their school if you're still in school, okay. But if not, it's something that 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 one can read and and and, and self teach to a certain extent, and uh, you know, hopefully that helps. Okay, let's take one last question. Um, what kind of questions should I be asking employers about their engineering organization to see if the company is a good fit for me? Okay, that's an interesting question. The, um, you know, first of all, I, I think that asking people what they do is, uh, you know, what they do and how they spend their time is actually a, 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 a you know, interesting to know. Um, I think that, you know, there, there are a lot of different jobs in the world and industries in the world that are interesting. And, um, you know, trying to find out what is interesting about a, you know, when you, I'm not kind of assuming you're interviewing at a company, okay, and you're talking to the people in the company, finding out how they spend their time and what they do and how they like working there and why they like working there. These, these are probably good, good things to tell. One of the, you know, disadvantages of living in a COVID world is that travel has stopped and that we're doing all these things by Zoom. I think it's probably extremely hard to figure out what goes on in a company by Zoom. Okay, I think that there's a certain level of personal interaction and roaming the halls and uh, see, see, seeing how people are that is kind of important. So one question that I think I would be asking at one point, certainly if I had a job offer, even if it was virtual, is there a way that you can fly me out there to actually see the joint? Okay. Because I think that 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 getting a, a a sense of what 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 is actually happening at a company is important. Um, these are questions for informing you. You know, you know, informing yourself. You should have some idea of what you want from your career and life, and what what are the things that are important. And the real question is, are these being kind of met by the lifestyles of the people that you'd be working with? And uh, I think that you know. Talking to them on a friendly and formal basis, again, over a meal, is often a great way to do that. 
Right. Thank you. Thanks for all the great advice, Steve. Um, that concludes the keynote presentation. Thank you for kicking off the HackRank Virtual Career Fair. And thank you to the audience for joining us. So good, you know, good luck to all of you get, uh, uh, at the career fair and beyond. You will get it. You you will get a good job. Okay, and good luck with that. Thank you, um, everyone in the audience. We encourage you to stick around for company presentations happening throughout the day today and tomorrow. And we hope you enjoy the fair. Thank you. Thank you very much.